Hi, let me turn on my mic. All right, hello, welcome to the, uh, the third installation, the third live stream event from our, ac our academic program at ANSYS. Thank you for joining uh, those in the room and, and those on YouTube. Uh, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and follow our, uh, follow our channel uh, and, and like the video, share it with your friends. We're gonna do structural analysis today uh, and specifically we're digging into topology optimization. So uh, I hope you guys are gonna find this, these topics really interesting. Um, but before we get started with the technology, a quick thank you to the Envision Arts and Engineering Maker Studio, uh, without whom we, we just wouldn't be doing these events. It's a fantastic space. If you're on campus at UCSD, you have to check this place out. Um, and you know, if, you're, if you're a company, you should consider doing an event here. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, also, thank you to the IT and AV services at UC San Diego. So today you're going to discover, you know, if, you have, if you've been following our, our earlier events, you already know this, but you know, simulation is leveraged in every industry. Um, learning simulation in school is a highly attainable goal. Uh, we make it as easy as possible. And uh, so today we're going to cover the basics of FEA theory just a little bit, uh, and we're getting to the practical application of FEA with ANSYS Mechanical. And so by the end of the day, you're going to understand that knowing how to innovate with simulation is absolutely a key to launching early career engineers into the companies they want to work for. So today we're the third event out of four. So if you missed our earlier events, feel free to go on our Tech Tips YouTube channel and uh, you know, just go ahead and rewatch them at your own, at your own pace. And uh, make sure if you're interested in autonomous vehicle simulation, antenna design, that kind of stuff, high frequency electronics, that'll be on Thursday. Same time, same place. So, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a key slide. It just demonstrates that uh, over time, more and more engineers have had to learn simulation, and they're expected to know it when they start their careers. So learning it in school is, is not only a differentiator, it's, it's actually becoming quite essential. And today, uh, as with our other events for our back to school uh, workshops, we're gonna focus on design, right? So simulation is used throughout the product life cycle, whether it's IoT applications, uh, ideation, where you barely know what the idea looks like and you're doing napkin sketches. You know, today we're focusing on, on the design and specifically how to optimize that. Uh, and literally every industry benefits from simulation, but when I think about topology optimization, I tend to think about things that go on a vehicle. Uh, something that has to be very lightweight or something that's made with uh, additive processes. You know, th think 3D printing. Uh, that's the technology we're going to be taking a look at today. And again, uh, we'll also do an overview of uh, ANSYS Mechanical to start off. So you see, okay, we're doing topology optimization today, but what else can you do with ANSYS Mechanical? And for those of you watching from a student design team, like solar car, race car, hyperloops, uh, rocket teams, uh, I hope you know the ANSYS sponsor student teams. If you watched our other two videos, you definitely know that. Uh, please consider you know, uh, asking us for sponsorship. I've already had a few inquiries from these videos, and I hope we get a lot more. So please, uh, design teams, we'd love to sponsor you with some software and training. And why are we doing that? Well, because it helps you get a job. Uh, companies are looking to hire engineers with the skill set of simulation and who do well at their design competition. So, you know, again, please consider that. And uh, if you want to learn more simulation after this event, I get that question all the time. What do I do next? Uh, well, you should take a look at the, the massive open online course that ANSYS developed in conjunction with Cornell University. You know, I should say Cornell developed it in conjunction with us because it's, it's extremely high quality. You feel like you're at a Cornell class. Uh, so I, I it covers CFD and mechanical, so please check that out. Uh, so if you want to learn something more specific, take a look on YouTube. Search the topic you're interested in, hashtag learn ANSYS. That will come up with a ton of content, not only from ANSYS uh, in our Tech Tips channel, but from our channel partners, such as Simutech and PADT. You've got to check those guys out. And if you have a question and you want to get it answered by a, a, a peer, a colleague, a uh, professor, or even an ANSYS engineer, you should post it on the ANSYS student community. Uh, this, is a, this is a forum. It works a lot like Reddit. You can vote questions up. You can vote them down. Um, but basically, it's a place for you to get your questions answered. And our engineers actually spend time every day answering questions on this. So 
please take advantage. It's a great resource for students uh, or even researchers and faculty who have a you know, quick technical question that they can describe with a screenshot, uh, maybe an error message or description. Throw it on there, see if we can, we can answer your question. Lastly, how do you access ANSYS? If you're a student, um, ask your professor or IT director, hey, does my school have ANSYS? Can I, you know, do we already have it? Most likely you do. Um, if you, you know, if that doesn't work, try getting your student team sponsored. You know, if you're on a rocket team, a race car, check us out there. Um, uh, another, another option for you is our free student product at ansys.com student. It covers CFD and mechanical. And last but not least, go ahead and click contact us on that website. If you need something more specific, a non-student version, for example, feel free to click there and to get in touch with us. We're happy to help. So here's my contact information. You can feel free to connect with me. And, uh, and you know, now we're going to launch into the real uh, the technical stuff for today, you know, ANSYS Mechanical. So we have, luckily here, we have a PhD in this kind of stuff. Um, his name is Solomon um, uh, Kachikorn, sorry, butchered that. But uh, yeah, he's here to uh, give you an overview of ANSYS Mechanical, and then we jump in with topology optimization. So uh, thank you, Saul. OK, thank you, Jacob. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Salman Kalkorin. I'm a senior application engineer for ANSYS uh, based out of uh, Irvine, California. And today, really, I want to give everyone an overview of really what the power of ANSYS Mechanical holds and how you can use this tool to you know, further your designs as well as your potential careers in the future. So I'm going to start by talking about a few things. The first thing being the workbench simulation platform. And then I'll, I'll kind of go into ANSYS purely in a, from a structural mechanics perspective. And then we'll do a few examples at the end, actually getting our hands wet with the software. And I'll show a couple of demonstrations of, of how you apply the software to solve different types of physics and different types of design challenges. So starting off, um, all of ANSYS mechanical and ANSYS structural tools are housed inside the ANSYS workbench platform. Now, the ANSYS Workbench platform can be thought of as a project management suite. So not only does it enable you to run physics simulations, um, whether it's structural mechanics, computational fluid dynamics, uh, high frequency or low frequency electromagnetics, really the list of physics that are covered in the ANSYS product portfolio are quite vast. Um, and really the advantages of using an environment like Workbench is that A, it's CAD and PDM neutral. Now, what does that mean? So, you know, there's a, a lot of different CAD systems out there that are available to all different engineers. You know, someone might be using a tool like SolidWorks, someone might be using Creo or Pro Engineer, um, and the list really goes on. Um, so, ANSYS Workbench is not restrictive in the types of CAD you can use, and in fact, you can use um, native CAD geometries from any native source. So, that really avoids some of the pains um, required to import files from STEP or IGES sources. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. Uh, another major benefit for Workbench is the drag and drop multi-physics. So in the real world, we know that you know, physics isn't really limited to just mechanical or just electronics or electromagnetics or just computational fluid dynamics. Really in the real world, when we're designing real systems, we need to consider having multiple effects, you know, electromagnetic effects coupled with fluid dynamic effects coupled with structural mechanics effects, right? So really, Workbench allows you to link and drag and drop uh, multiple different analysis systems together to create, um, ultimately, what we like to call a digital twin of what you're trying to design, okay? And I'll, and I'll show that um, as we move along as well. So looking at the Workbench platform, I show a few different examples here. So it gives you the ability to manage your projects. So you can have multiple different design cases, um, there might be certain load cases, certain you know, conditions that your design might be subjected to in operation that you want to test out, right? Ultimately, we run simulations in order to test our designs virtually, right? Now, why do you ask, why would we want to test our designs virtually? Because the truth of the matter and the fact of the matter is that, you know, 
experiments and ex experimental test fixtures, designing experimental test fixtures can get very costly, right? And it also takes a lot of time to run through multiple steps and, and go through those project, uh, processes. So testing things virtually upfront in the design cycle is, is quite important. So this shows a typical ANSYS workbench workflow. Okay, so we're running a static structural analysis. Okay, now static structural analysis tests the uh, static equilibrium uh, response of a system to a set of mechanical loads, right? And we'll, we'll talk a lot about that as we move forward. But really, individual analysis blocks in ANSYS workbench are, are highlighted as follows. So if you notice, this static structural system has an entry for engineering data for geometry, for model, setup, solution, and results. Now these are step-by-step -step, uh, guidance steps that re are required to set up a, a full-on uh, analysis system. So let's focus in on the first one, which is engineering data. So in reality, uh, materials that we use have different properties associated with them, right? If we're designing something out of steel, it's going to behave mechanically quite different than if it was designed out of aluminum or out of copper. Right? So engineering data is really where you um, assign and define your different material properties and effectively the overall performance of that particular part in your assembly. Now the next part is geometry. So as I mentioned, you import your geometry from any source. I mean, in fact, you can actually draw up your uh, CAD geometries inside the ANSYS Workbench platform uh, with a tool called ANSYS Space Claim Direct Modeler. Uh, and I'll show a demonstration of that as we move along today as well, okay? Another thing I wanna highlight is the use of parameters. Now, what are parameters? So whenever you create a design, you have multiple parameters that you as the designer are in control of, right? So for example, you may not have the ability to modify the mounting points on a particular design, but you may have control over the thicknesses of certain areas, and you ultimately want to stay within your design criteria while using the least amount of material, right? So parameters are designed to allow you to explore parametric space, whether it's in terms of varying geometry, varying material properties, varying loading, and um, boundary conditions, and also looking at how those changes and parameters affect your re overall results. Right? So inside the Workbench platform, we have a tool called Design Explorer that allows you to run these types of optimizations. So in fact, once you have your parameter space defined, you can actually run different types of optimizations in order to get the ideal scenario, but instead of you doing all the work and figuring it out, it's actually ANSYS and the software that's doing all of the work and figuring it out, okay? So I mentioned ANSYS Space Claim. Um, so ANSYS Space Claim is used as a CAD geometry creation tool as well as a geometry pre preparation for analysis tool, right? So inside ANSYS Space Claim, it gives you the ability to create a lot of different um, geometries purely from scratch. Um, it's also very, very good in the 3D printing realm. So in 3D printing, we deal with uh, STL files, which are tessellated representat representations of the geometry that we would like printed. Now, ANSYS Space Claim not only has solid geometry editing capabilities, but also can deal very well with um, high density and high quality faceted geometry editing as well. So what this all boils down to is in ANSYS Workbench, in the real world, really there's two uh, or more physics at play, right? Not everything can be summarized in a structural mechanics perspective. Um, not everything can be summarized in a fluid dynamics perspective and so on. So what Workbench allows is for you to explore not only individual physics, but also link these, the results from these different physics environments together in order to get useful results. So in this particular case, I'm showing a link from our low frequency electromagnetics tool, Maxwell, uh, which links directly into ANSYS Fluent, which is a computational fluid dynamics sol solver. And both of those are contributing information or input loads into the steady state thermal analysis. So not, in this case, I'm not prescribing what the loading is for my particular analysis. In fact, Maxwell and Fluent are calculating, due to those electromagnetic and fluid dynamic physics, what inputs are required for my loading in a structural thermal 
type analysis, which is shown in these two blocks shown here. Okay? So really, when you take multiple physics into account, it really gives you vastly different answers than if you were to run as just for a single physics. So I'm showing here a plot of, we're tracking the torque over time on a particular component in our simulation. So if we look, when we're running with a single physics and making all sorts of assumptions on the other physics, for example, the electromagnetic behavior and the computational fluid dynamics behavior, when we make those assumptions, we're generally um, either being over conservative or you know, not allowing and not taking all of the loadings into account. Now when we do this, we tend to either under or overestimate the performance of our design. Now, as we all know, under or overestimating the performance of our design could lead to, you know, over, overpaying for the same part. You know, material costs could go up because our design is over-engineered, or it could be on the other side where we under-engineer the part and it ends up failing and costing us a lot of money to replace. So having said all that about ANSYS Workbench, um, I now want to shift focus into ANSYS Structural Mechanics. Okay. So everything from now on will be focused on ANSYS Mechanical and the ANSYS Mechanical Solver. Um, so there's a series of different analysis types that can be handled inside ANSYS Mechanical. The first being static structural analysis, where we have static equilibrium. We're essentially defining the forces and the reaction of our assembly or part to those um, static forces. Um, now, ANSYS Mechanical has both a linear and nonlinear analysis capability. So linear analysis would be the case where everything is assumed linear. We have an elastic modulus that, you know, stress and strain are linearly related. We have contacts in our model. So for example, if two things are touching in the beginning of a contact or the beginning of an analysis, they will remain in contact for the remainder of the analysis. Um, and also, all of our deflections are uh, negligible, meaning that we're getting small amounts of deflection that do not affect the overall stiffness of a part. Okay. Uh, on the nonlinear sense, that, those are the more complex computational problems that um, take into account things like plastic deformation, right? So for example, uh, if you bend a paper clip, right? A paper clip initially, if you bend it very slightly, it doesn't change much, right? It'll bounce back to where it was initially, right? But if you bend it too far, what happens to the paper clip? It will remain in that deformed configuration, right? So that's an example or simple example of plastic deformation, right? So those types of effects are nonlinear, meaning your stress versus strain curve is no longer linear. Okay? So now we have a also a breadth of full dynamic capabilities, right? So dynamics is the case where you're solving the full dynamic equation, right? So mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to f, right? Your forcing function. So in these cases, we're actually solving for the dynamic behavior. So we have static type loads and dynamic type loads. So in terms of structural dynamics, uh, ANSYS Mechanical has the solve types for modal analysis, harmonic analysis, which would incorporate a sinusoidal forcing function, right, that ranges over a course of different frequencies. And then we have response spectrum analysis, which is used more for earthquake or shock type loadings. And it's used very widely in the nuclear industry. And we also have random vibration. So for example, if you're, you know, you made your design and you're all happy with it, right? What happens when you put that design on a truck and ship it off uh, uh, to New York, right? We're in California right now, by the way. But, you know, it would go through certain vibrations during that transport, right? Or what if it's mounted on a rocket, right? And that rocket gets shot up into the uh, atmosphere at a, you know, there's certain vibrations that go along with that. Um, and, you know, many times those r vibrations are random, meaning that they occur at very different frequencies and very different magnitudes, right? So um, those are some of the linear type dynamic analyses. And then we have a full transient analysis, which is, takes into account all the time dependent behavior. So if you have loading that's time dependent, if you want to um, look at the duration of a load or you want to turn like a heat source on or off, those are considered transient type analyses. Okay. And then we also have a multi-body dynamic solver um, with ANSYS Rigid Dynamics. So if you're looking at modeling any kinematic assemblies or doing any machine design, um, all of that is done through a rigid dynamic solver. So 
even though the tool is called mechanical and it's mechanical, we also have a full-fledged heat transfer solver as well. So in this case, what we're looking for is the temperature distribution on a particular geometry. So ANSYS Mechanical can solve conduction, convection, and radiation heat transfer, okay? And that's both in the steady state or equilibrium state as well as transient or time-dependent state, okay? And then there's a series of other different um, analysis types that we can handle as well, um, ranging from magnetics um, all the way up to acoustics, et cetera. So the traditional workflow of dealing with ANSYS Mechanical is you always start with a geometry. So you either have a geometry or you're going to create a geometry and you import that and then you define your materials as well as your contacts, okay? And then the next step is meshing and I'll go very, uh, talk briefly about meshing in a minute. And then you get to the solution phase where the computer is actually chug chugging through the solution and solving the problem. And then ultimately you deal with the re region of post-processing where you extract useful results um, for your particular analysis. Okay. So let's start by talking about basic analysis procedure, right? So there is a lot of theory behind finite element analysis, um, but we're going to focus on the steady state or static solutions, okay? So in reality, uh, what FEA is solving is F equals KX, okay? Now, that may seem very familiar to everyone as the equation of a uniaxial spring, right? You have a force equals the stiffness times the deflection, okay? But in reality, whenever you're solving a finite element analysis sol uh, solution, which is the basis for ANSYS Mechanical and all commercial um, structural analysis codes, but what you're essentially doing is you're summarizing your geometry as a function of the stiffness, which would be your K term, and the forces that are being applied, okay? And what you're solving for, or the unknown, is the displacements, okay? So if we look at a particular CAD model geometry here, we actually have a, a CAD assembly um, that was created in some uh, CAD software. And once you bring it into ANSYS Mechanical, um, everything is decomposed into these tiny elements, okay? And we, that's hence the name finite element analysis, okay? Now each of these elements, which are these volumetric building blocks, are connected together via nodes, okay? So the terms elements and nodes are, will be used very widely when talking about this type of structural analysis. And really all they're referring to is this volumetric building block here. In this case, we're using a tetrahedral shape. And the nodes refer to the points or the vertices at the uh, corners of each of these three-dimensional elements. Okay? Now, one thing to note whenever you're running a simulation is that you're essentially working on an idealized CAD model, right? So this is basically your design as you intended it to be designed and manufactured, right? But in reality, when we manufacture a part, there's all sorts of manufacturing tolerances, right? that affect the overall and final geometry um, that we're provided with from wherever we got it manufactured, right? So that's the first thing. Then the next thing is you actually go through and discretize and split up and break this up into tiny little blocks that serve two purposes. The first purpose is to capture effectively the geometry, okay? So if you notice here, if for example, I meshed a circular piece with only four nodes around the corners, I would end up with a square, right? But so the quality of your mesh, meaning the discretization and how refined your mesh is, really dictates what the solver sees. As soon as you mesh the geometry, the solver no longer sees the original CAD. What it's looking at is in fact the nodes and elements and the mesh that you create based on that CAD, okay? So meshing is, is for any type of analysis, specifically finite element analysis, is very, very important, okay? Um, not only does it uh, dictate the accuracy of your solution, the, the numbers that you're getting out of the software, but also it, it affects the computational time required to solve these types of problems. Okay, so I mentioned that ANSYS can import native CAD geometry from any source, and the reality is it, it really can. So if we look at the 
different CAD systems that are listed here on the slide. Um, these are all, just a few of the major CAD systems that we can read natively into ANSYS Mechanical. Uh, and another thing about um, ANSYS Workbench is that we can actually instill bi-directional associativity, meaning we can actually pass and transfer data back and forth between many of these CAD systems. Um, so this one example here is actually showing the interface with SOLIDWORKS. Um, so in, if you're using SOLIDWORKS for your CAD, you actually have the capability of importing and sending that um, geometry directly into ANSYS Workbench. So not only will that transfer the geometry, but also the material properties, those material assignments, um, as well as any geometric parameters that you have defined in the CAD model. So I mentioned materials. So you can think of materials as the inputs to the calculator, right? You can think about ANSYS Mechanical as a calculator, right? A calculator is just as, as only as good as the information that you feed it, right? So if you want to have an accurate uh, answer or accurate results, you need to make sure that you apply the correct material properties. So the good news is ANSYS Mechanical has a series of different, um, both linear and nonlinear material properties. So linear. Linear would be when you have a linear stress-strain relation, right? Stress-strain curve is purely linear. And nonlinear is anywhere where you have a stress-strain curve that is not linear, right? So if you're examining, you know, things like creep, so creep, for example, is a high temperature phenomena that m metals go through. Um, so if you heat it up to a certain percentage of its melting temperature, you'll actually see you know, stresses and stre stresses develop over constant strain over time, okay? And um, then we have different gasket materials, plastics, rubbers, you know, different types of material models that are specific to certain classes of materials. And all of those can be defined directly in the ANSYS Workbench platform. Um, you can also use experimental curves. So if you've done a tensile test or you have experimental data or, from a, or a stress strain curve on a particular part or a particular material, you can certainly um, input that data directly, and ANSYS has a, a series of different curve fitting options to fit that data into simulation data, okay? So talking about the different um, disciplines within structural mechanics, okay? So everything in mechanics can be summarized in terms of static loading and dynamic loading, okay? So static loading means you have F equals uh, some of the forces is equal to zero, right? So you have some of the forces um, in your statics class, right? Everything was always equal to zero. But then things got a little bit more difficult in dynamics class, right? Because not everything was equal to zero. So you can think about it the same way in a, in a finite element analysis using ANSYS Mechanical. So you have your static analysis, which assumes that the sum of your forces will be zero, meaning all of the forces that you input will come out at the reactions in the supports. And, and we also have dynamic behavior. For example, if you want to know the resonance frequencies and mode shapes, so at a particular frequency, is my um, assembly or part going to resonate? Or am I going to excite a resonance frequency at a particular frequency, right? So, and also we have capabilities of modeling drop tests. So for example, for electronics or other consumer products, um, whenever we design these types of geom or parts, we always have to test certain um, aspects of those geometries before sending them off to market, okay? So these are just some of the other um, capabilities that we have um, directly within ANSYS Mechanical, right? So as I mentioned, modal analysis is the capability to extract mode shapes and the resonance frequencies for a particular geometry. So I'm showing here a PCB board um, or an electronic board that's mounted at a particular region, and we're, we're looking at the vibrational characteristics of that particular board. So this, using a modal analysis um, can allow you to predict what those resonance frequencies are so that you can use this information to make sure that your, reson or your operating condition of this particular design falls outside of these different frequencies. Um, the reason being is that when you design something and you look at the resonance frequencies, so if this design is attached somewhere downstream to another part that's causing some sort of vibrational load 
onto your part, right? For example, an engine, right, and how it interfaces with the exhaust at the back of the vehicle, right? If that engine starts vibrating at a certain frequency, it's going to start vibrating everything else that has a resonance frequency at that particular frequency. So we'd like to get an understanding of that uh, prior to you know, a applying and placing our you know, assembly downstream from another component. So I mentioned also um, drops. So for example, you know, these are catastrophic events, right? So for example, you, you know, buy a particular, you know, a new Game Boy or something, or a new iPad, right? What happens when you drop it? Probably nothing, but why nothing, right? Because, you know, these things have been designed to withstand certain levels of dropping, right? Whether it's from a certain height, whether it's from a certain angle. And these types of analyses are generally run in a software or type of solving called explicit dynamics, right? So ANSYS has a couple flavors of uh, explicit dynamics that you can use to solve these types of rapid impacting loads on over short time durations. Okay. So similarly, um, we have the same type of capabilities in terms of thermal analysis. So thermal analysis deals with the heat transfer through different geometries, right? So for example, if you have a heat generating component somewhere in your assembly, and you know what temperature that's at, but you wanna see how much heat is being generated by that component and how it's flowing or conducting through the rest of the assembly, right? So we have both steady state and transient thermal analysis capabilities in ANSYS Mechanical. Um, so steady state, again, being your equilibrium condition and transient being your time dependent Loading. So if you have something on, for example, for five minutes, and then you turn it off, and you want to see how rapidly that cools down, you know, that would be something like a transient analysis. But if you want to see you know, how hot something can potentially get subject to a certain load, you would run that with a steady state thermal analysis. Okay. So in ANSYS Mechanical, you can run uh, models for conduction, convection, and radiation heat transfer. Okay, so the three primary modes of heat transfer. So using the, or leveraging the ANSYS Workbench platform, it really makes it easy to interface between both thermal and structural analysis in one. So this is showing the Workbench schematic up here at the top right for a thermal stress analysis, right? So for example, if you take a particular design or a part and you heat that part up to a certain temperature. It's going to have the tendency to either expand or contract depending on the material. But for the most part, if we're dealing primarily with metals, you know, they have the tendency to expand when heated and contract when cooled, right? Now, can those expansions and contractions generate mechanical stress in our part? Absolutely, right? Now, how do we take that into account? So, in, within the ANSYS workbench environment, you can actually link different mechanical blocks together. So in this case, we're showing a steady state thermal, and you can notice that there's a solution to the setup, has a connection. So this solution is in fact passing the temperature data that's solved for um, from the, this particular circuit board and passing it over to a structural analysis to assess what level of thermally induced strains are being generated as well as thermally induced stresses that are being generated between the mismatched coefficients of thermal expansion between the materials that are mounted on the board. Okay. So we also have a different type of analysis, but it's still an optimization study, right? So with the presence of additive manufacturing and 3D printing becoming more and more popular nowadays, uh, it's actually you know, being many times called a paradigm shift in the way we manufacture parts and the way we think about um, developing parts. So a uh, few releases back, ANSYS uh, Mechanical introduced the top topology optimization technique. Now what that does is it will actually have an end-to-end -end workflow starting from a primitive shape and working through the full analysis and taking into account different optimization parameters that you feed it and ultimately give you a geometry that meets either your stress criteria, displacement criteria, you know, um, you know, you have a certain stiffness to mass or stiffness to weight ratio that you want to fulfill. You know, all of these things can be um, expedited using a topology optimizer. 
Now, what this does is it will effectively take your original primitive part, and in this one, you would set up an actual stress analysis for that part, and then you'll go ahead and follow all the steps to set up a mechanical analysis, and then run the optimizer, and what it will do is it will give you a final geometry um, that you can also then uh, export into STL file for direct 3D printing or for post-processing of the actual geometry. Um, so within SpaceClaim, you can actually fully convert that into a solid geometry that you can either use for storing or as reference for actually designing your part. And then you can import that back in and make validation studies to make sure that you know, all of the, the actual geometry that ANSYS fed out to you meets all of your design criteria and goals. Okay. And then ultimately, um, this part was actually printed from an ANSYS design. So ANSYS mechanical software actually designed this part, and it was 3D printed using you know, one of our 3D printing partners. Okay. So with that, I'll actually start to um, work through an, an example problem inside ANSYS mechanical. So the way you open up ANSYS Mechanical is as follows. So from the start menu, you can find the version of ANSYS that you're using, and all ANSYS Mechanical type uh, simulations are run through the ANSYS Workbench environment. So depending on what version you have, the current release is actually 19.2, okay? So ANSYS has three major uh, releases per year. Um, so the first one is 19 or XX.0, and then we have a dot one and dot two release per release cycle. Okay. So this is the ANSYS Workbench platform. Okay. So inside Workbench, you'll see on the left-hand side a series of different analysis systems. Now, those analysis systems are actually representative of different physics. Okay. So in this case, <clears throat> I have different options for, for example, uh, structural analysis, so anything uh, labeled in green here will be a structural analysis. Anything in red will be a thermal analysis. Uh, we reserve the color purple for acoustic analysis, right? And we also have integration with our other core solvers, for example, uh, Mac ANSYS Maxwell or ANSYS HFSS, and also our computational fluid dynamic solutions as well. So any single physics related to ANSYS mechanical or multi-physics related to ANSYS mechanical and other physics solvers can be linked up together in the workbench environment. Okay. So let's walk through a, a simple example. Okay. So uh, in this case, what I want to do is I've been tasked with the job to design a particular bracket, right? And I, and I know that this bracket is going into um, an additive manufacturing. It's going to be manufactured via additive manufacturing. So I have a lot of freedom in where I cut material away and the overall shape and size of the geometry. So what I'm going to do is I'll drag and drop a static structural analysis, okay? And if you notice, just by left-clicking and dragging it, it now drops a static structural system onto the workbench project schematic, right? And then, as I mentioned, you can link different analysis systems together. So what I'll do is I'll link up the topology optimization, and you notice I can actually drag and drop it onto the solution level of static structural. So when I drop it there, you notice that now my engineering data, geometry, model, and solution are all linked to the topology optimization system, okay? So the first thing I want to do is choose what material properties I, I want to work with, okay? So if I double click on engineering data, you notice I have a system where I can actually create my own materials or choose from the engineering data sources which contain all of ANSYS Mechanical's uh, material libraries. So if I wanted to create my own material, you know, I could just type, let's say I'm using a special alloy of titanium, I can type that in and name my material, and then I can go through the left-hand side which shows all of the material models and material properties that we have for assignment in Mechanical, and I can just simply drag and drop those onto my newly created material. So in, for, in this example, for, I want to apply density, let's say isotropic elasticity, where I have my elastic modulus and my Poisson's ratio. And you know, there's also other things as well. So if I want to model the thermal expansion effect, I can drop an isotropic thermal expansion and define my coefficient of thermal expansion. So as you see here, 
anything that requires now an input will be highlighted in yellow, and now I can go in there and type in the values that I choose to use for my material. So that's if I, you know, I have a pretty custom material that I want to input into Mechanical. You also have an option to go into the Engineering Data Sources option here, and you can choose individual materials from the uh, different material libraries that we have here. So what I'll do is I'll highlight the general materials library and I'll choose what material that I want to use. Let's say in this case I want to use this stainless steel um, and I want to add, let's say, magnesium alloy as well as an aluminum alloy to my simulation. So once I untoggle the engineering data sources box, I now see that I have all of those materials listed in my uh, analysis list. So once I have that, any material that's listed in the engineering data library can be used to assign materials inside ANSYS Mechanical. Okay? So once I have my materials chosen out, I next have the option to either import a geometry. So if I import the geometry, I'll hit browse, and I can import native CAD from you know, any of the sources listed in the dropdown. So you can see that uh, many of the commercially available formats are listed here in this list, or I have the option to create my own geometry using ANSYS Space Claim. So what I'll do is I'll right click on geometry and I'll choose the option for new Space Claim geometry. Okay. So what this will do is with, from within Workbench, it will launch the ANSYS Space Claim graphic user interface. Now with the ANSYS uh, Space Claim graphic user interface, I now have the option to start creating geometry on my own. Okay. So <clears throat> Space Claim always starts with a blank s screen. So what I have here is a, essentially a blank design space um, that I can use to draw up and design my material. So Space Claim works on the concept of starting with primitives and then either extruding or revolving them into solids. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll start by creating a simple geometry here. I'll start by creating a rectangle. Remember, I'm just trying to get a primitive representation of the geometry that I want to design, and I'm going to go ahead and do that quickly inside Space Claim. So the first thing I want to do is I want to design or choose my sketch plane. So what I'll do is I'll click the button down here to select the new sketch plane, and I'll hover over the XY plane to select that as my sketch plane. And then I can snap my view using the plan view button here to look head on, right? So once I have the rectangle option selected, I can now define that rectangle from the center and I'll click at the origin here and I'll specify the original dimensions of my bracket. Now these are going to define, you know, I have my bracket and I have my specific mounting points for that bracket. So now where do I want that bracket or uh, what are the sizing constraints that I have on that bracket. So let's say that the length of the rectangular plate is 110 millimeters, and then I'll choose the height to be 50 millimeters, right? So now that I have that uh, rectangular block, I'll now start to draw in the mounting points. So to do that, I'll choose the circle option, and I'll use the circle option to draw different uh, circles, uh, to represent the mounting points of this bracket. So here, I'll set the diameter to 10 millimeters, and then I'll use the move option to select that circle, and if I click on these different handles, these enable me to drag the geometry uh, to specific locations. Um, I can also click on the, the direction I want to move and highlight the ruler option here, and that allows me to actually select a reference measurement point. So in this case, I want it to be 12 millimeters from the top. And on this side, I also want it to be 12 millimeters from the left-hand side as well. Right? So now once I have that input, I can hit the escape key and go ahead and draw another circle, which represents this mounting point over here. So again, I'll click and drag type 10 millimeters to create that 10 millimeter hole, and I'll use the move operation to make sure that that's spaced also 
12 millimeters away from that individual component. So once that's done, I have an outline or a two-dimensional view of what I'm trying to design, right? And so I can actually click on this return to 3D mode and review what I have. So now I have surfaces, uh, actually one surface, that has two holes cut out of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down the control key and select the two surfaces and click on delete. So when I click the delete option, it will remove those holes out and now I can use the option to pull to extrude that surface into a three-dimensional object. So in this case, what I'll do is I'll drag it and I'll set that thickness to 10 millimeters, right? So once I have that, I now have a three-dimensional, very primitive solid that I'm going to actually use or have ANSYS um, design an optimal uh, bracket for my particular constraints that I specify, okay? So once my geometry is done, I can actually go ahead and minimize space claim. And you notice now that inside the workbench platform, I have a space claim logo next to my geometry, as well as a check mark, which means that that step has been satisfied. So within the workbench environment, it guides you through those processes and tells you that, you know, if you have a check mark, you're good to go. Um, and a refresh or recycle option means that you need to refresh that step. So what I'm going to do is double click on model to open up ANSYS Mechanical. Okay, so once I open up Mechanical, you'll notice that the geometry that I just created in Space Claim is now inside this ANSYS Mechanical window. So looking at ANSYS Mechanical here on the left-hand side, these are all of the steps that are required for me to run a successful finite element analysis uh, on this particular geometry. So you may say that, hey, that's a very primitive geometry. Um, what did you even do? You created a rectangle, extruded it, and drilled two holes out of it, right? That's not that too hard to do. So in reality, what I'm going to do is now start to define uh, the mounting points. So how is this bracket going to be supported? So let's say it's attached at this particular location and I'm uh, expecting it to have a particular load of a particular magnitude in the Y direction on this particular hole. So what I'll do here is in geometry, I'll go to this part and highlight it. And the way mechanical will work is that anything you highlight in the outline tree will then um, have a details window associated with it where you have information about that selected entity, right? So in this case, I'll select my assignment and I'll choose in this case structural steel for that piece, okay? And I'll go through now and start to mesh that geometry, okay? So meshing is the concept of splitting this geometry into its individual components. So either I can stick to a default mesh, so if I right click on the mesh geometry, I can hit generate mesh and it will create a default mesh size for my particular application. Um, but in, in, for my particular case, I want enough elements to accurately um, be able to give me an accurate solution to my geometry. So what I'll do is I'll insert a sizing and I'll specify that sizing to be two millimeters. So what I'm doing here is I'm specifying that each element in this uh, part is actually going to be two millimeters in size. Okay? So when I go and generate the mesh again, you'll notice that it now creates a more structured mesh with finer elements. And now I can go ahead and start to set up my loads and boundary conditions and actually run the simulation on this part. Okay. So next you'll see that I have two analysis systems that are highlighted beneath the uh, meshing. So I have my static structural system and I also have my topology optimization system. So what topology optimization is going to do is it's actually going to use the results from my static structural simulation and optimize the geometry based on the results that it gets from the uh, static structural simulation. So what I'll do in the static structural, I'll highlight the static structural step and I'll start to apply my loading as well as my boundary conditions. So boundary conditions is the term used for supports, okay? 
So anywhere where this part is supported, you will apply a boundary condition to that part. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to assume that this particular surface can only be move, um, it can slide up and down and move inward and outward, but it cannot move uh, in the X direction. So what I can do is highlight that surface using the face select filter here. I can select that surface and then right click insert a fixed support or frictionless support. A frictionless support will only constrain it in the normal direction. So normal to that surface, um, pointing out of that surface will be constrained, but it's free to move um, both in the Z direction as shown in the axis here and the Y direction. It's only fixed in X, okay? So for the next one, I'm gonna assume that this bracket now has a pin that's placed um, within this. So I don't have CAD for the pin. So instead of actually inputting the CAD for that particular pin, I'm going to use a boundary condition to mimic the presence of a pin. So what I'll do is I'll insert a cylindrical support. And with a cylindrical support, you actually see that I have radial, axial, and tangential components, okay? So radial, of course, will be the opening, the tendency of that hole to open. That would be the radial direction. Your axial direction would be in and out of the hole, so the axis of the cylinder. And the third one is the tangential. So tangential would be the twisting degree of freedom, right, about that hole. So what I'll do to fix this particular hole is I'll leave the radial and the axial degrees of freedom fixed, but I'll free up the tangential. So what that allows is for this hole to actually deform and rotate about the center of that cylinder. Okay. And lastly, what I'll do is I'll select that particular hole there where my bracket is mounted to another mounting point, and I'll apply a force. So when I apply that force, I'll do it in terms of components, and I'll say that the force acting on that particular hole is in the Y direction. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll specify a thousand newtons of load um, acting upward on that particular hole. Okay. So in this case, I'm working in newtons and millimeters, but inside the ANSYS mechanical environment, you have the option to choose any unit system that you feel comfortable working in. Okay. All of the values will then be converted. So for example, if I chose inches now, after I've set everything up in, in meters, you notice now that my load is in terms of LBF, which is Libra force, right? And my constraints or meshing controls, for example, are now in terms of inches as well. Instead of reporting them in millimeters, it does the, the unit conversion automatically and converts between unit systems, right? So once that's done, I'll go ahead and solve the model. So when you're solving the model, um, all of the steps that I followed up until now are actually the pre-processing steps, okay? Um, once I click the solution button, it will actually be the solve step, which means your job is done, and now it's the computer's job to solve the actual system of equations. So now, once the solution is done, you'll see a green check mark next to solution, and you right-click, insert, and these are all of your post-processing options that you have here. So if I click here, uh, I can look at things like deformations, either components or total or magnitude. I can look at different components of strain as well as principal strains and equivalence strains. Uh, I can also look at the same components for stresses. So if I'm interested in the von Mises stress or equivalent stress or any of the stress components, I can certainly look at that. So once I have the plots requested, I can actually insert the plot and actually review how my bracket deformed um, using that particular load. So subject to that load, this is how much deformation I'm getting in my particular bracket. So now if I go to my stresses, it will show me the stresses that develop in that part as well and it see, shows that I'm at about 22 megapascals of stress. Now, so I've did all the hard work, right? I've designed this CAD, it's really complex. And now, you know, I actually want to go through and have ANSYS help me out a little bit. I want to start doing a topology optimization based on these stress results. So before I do that, I want to make sure that I get all of my design rules uh, in check. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll check the directional deformation in the Y direction on that particular hole. And you notice that it's at about 
0.02 millimeters, right? That's very small deformation, but actually my design criteria says that it cannot deform more than 0.05 millimeters, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna specify that as a response constraint in the topology optimization, okay? So if you notice here, once I have my topology optimization, a few things are chosen by default, right? So it specifies my optimization region as this blue region or all bodies in the model, okay? And then I have my exclusion regions defined as my boundary conditions, meaning that exclusion regions, what they mean is I am not allowed to cut away material from those regions. So anything that's in those particular red regions on the plot there are actually going to be maintained. Okay. And then next is my objectives. So in my objective in a topology optimization is always to minimize the compliance. So compliance is the inverse of stiffness, meaning that your stiffness, by minimizing the compliance, you're actually maximizing the stiffness of the part. Okay. So by default, those are the objectives that are set. And then you have a default response constraint as well. So in this case, you're specifying what is the um, total mass or percent mass that you wish to retain. Okay. So in this case, I want to cut away 60% of the mass of this design um, and maintain 40%. Okay, and I'm also going to highlight topology optimization here and look at some of the other uh, manufacturing and response constraints that I can input. So for example, in this case, I want to specify a displacement constraint, okay, and it's asking me to specify the geometry. So I'll choose this hole here, and I'll specify the maximum Y deflection to be 0 0.05 as my design criteria called for. So I'll say that keep cutting away from this um, part, but stop after that deflection on that particular surface becomes greater than 0 0.05 millimeters, okay? Um, the last thing I wanna do is I wanna force this geometry to be symmetric. It can give me whatever it wants, but it has to be symmetric about a particular axis. So what I'll do is I'll actually use the existing geometry by highlighting the surface, and I'll insert a coordinate system on that top surface. So now I have a coordinate system that's centered about the center of that part, okay? So now if I right click on topology optimization, I can insert a symmetry constraint and I'll specify the new co coordinate system that I chose or coordinate system located here. And I'll specify that I want it to be symmetric about the Z, so about the Z axis, okay? So once all of my model is set up, I go ahead and click solve. So you, real, you realize how quickly the solve occurred for the static structural analysis, but this one is gonna take a little bit more time. Why? Because it's going to repeatedly try to cut material away from this particular design and keep checking to see that it's validating all of the constraints that I set in the optimization region. So you see here, it's going to go through and keep cutting away material from essentially areas where the load path does not fall or pass through, right? So it will keep material um, in any location where it actually detects that the load path is transferring through that region, but it will cut away anywhere where that's serving no purpose and in increasing the stiffness or adding to the structural integrity of this particular part. So if you notice with each iteration, you know, it's, it's narrowing down on a particular design. If you notice here, it hasn't, with each iteration, we're not changing much. We're just making uh, minor tweaks to the geometry until eventually it, it comes up to a finished solution, right? So after a few iterations, we get a part, right? So does this look a little bit different than the original part that we looked at? So why don't we go take a look at what the original part looked like. It was just this rectangular simplified block. But now if we look at this one, we have our topology optimized part. Now, looking at this part, you might say, okay, well, there's no way that I can manufacture this with traditional means, which is definitely true, right? This is an organic shape. Um, but that's where the beauty of ad additive manufacturing comes in, right? So even though I can't uh, create this part using traditional manufacturing means, I can do one of two things with this, what ANSYS has given me here. The first thing 
is I can actually use this to go back to my original design and make those cutouts in the CAD myself, right? I know now where I can remove material without compromising the structural integrity. So I'll go ahead back to the CAD and make those cutouts, right? So that's designing your own part based on this particular geometry. The other thing I can actually do is I can actually send this geometry off to a 3D printer. Now, the file format for a 3D printer is generally a STL file or stereolithography file, right? So actually in ANSYS Mechanical, you can export geometry directly to an STL file. So if I wanted to spit this out, I can choose the STL file um, and just go ahead and save that um, onto my desktop and it will output an STL file for this particular geometry. But I'm not quite done with this. I actually have more work to be done. So in the topology density tracker, um, what, I'm, what I can do is I can actually explore how much mass was retained and you know, how much material was actually removed from this part. So I, it shows me that what it's settled on, which is this geometry here, actually now has 45.2 or 0.3 percent of the original mass. Okay. Now, what I can do is I can actually drag the retained threshold either up or down to explore, do I want to add more material back to the part? And then that will actually show me now how you see that the percent mass of the original has increased to about 56 percent. Um, or do I want to go a little bit lower? But you notice that as I'm going lower and lower, it's removing too much material and I'm left with you know, a part that has no structural integrity whatsoever. Right? So it's always good to keep a happy medium, which in this case I'll set to the default, which was 0 0.5. And I'll go ahead and now I want to run a validation study to make sure that this part passes my criteria. So what I can do is go back to the workbench window and inside ANSYS workbench, I can right click on results and with one click, transfer to something called the design validation system. So now what that design validation system does is it will actually have all of the original setup to my original structural analysis and now pass the updated geometry into space claim so that I can prepare it for my analysis. Okay? So what I'll do is I'll update the topology optimization and pass that data by right clicking and refreshing. So recall that the green recycle system actually means refresh or recall, calls for a refresh. And once that's done, it will pass whatever geometry that I settled off of in topology optimization into my static structural system. So once that's done, I can now go in and edit the geometry in space claim. Okay, so now that I look at this geometry, I actually have an STL file, right? So you notice the STL is characterized by these small tessellations that are created on this geometry. So I have my STL file and my original geometry in the same space claim window. So what you can do in space claim is you can actually create a solid geometry from an STL file um, it, with one click. So if I wanted this to convert to solid CAD, I can highlight the part and then convert to solid and then choose the option to merge the faces. And when I merge the faces, what it's going to do is create a solid geometry. Um, so anywhere where you have a flat surface will be, uh, have a flat representation. So this is now a single surface. Um, but anywhere where there were tessellations that it wasn't able to resolve, will still have tessellations. Now, the benefit or the beauty of this is I can actually still run and mesh and run an analysis on this geometry directly in mechanical. But there are regions, for example, that I would want to quote unquote reverse engineer or repair. So you notice that this hole that was originally a cylinder now became a faceted cylinder, right? So you have these individual um, surfaces in each region that you might want to clean up. So inside space claim, not only can it be used to 
um, create geometry, but it can also be used to repair geometry. So what I'll do is I'll select using boundary these different surfaces. So what select using boundary does is it will allow me to use these as capping faces and allow me to select seed faces and select everything in between. So what I've done here is I've selected all of the surfaces associated with that hole and I'll hit the delete key on my keyboard and remove that out. So you notice that it, Space Claim will delete it and recreate the geometry as if that part was never there. So I'll repeat the same process. Again, select using boundary. Select the two opposing faces. Oops. In fact, I need to select this space and this space. and select that geometry and then go ahead and delete that again, right? So now I have a part that has no holes, right? So what I'll do now is go back to the original geometry and I'll select those two surfaces that I want to cut out again and I'll, on the toolbar here, what I'll do is I'll copy those two surfaces and I'll paste them back down. So when I do that, I now have two individual surfaces and the solid that I just created, okay? So within Space Claim, you also have Boolean subtracting and combining tools, right? So the tool is called Combine. So you notice I click the Combine tool at the top here, I'll select my target, and I'll go ahead and cut it out with those surfaces that I just copied out. So I'll repeat that process one more time and delete those holes out. So now I've essentially repaired the geometry and I have you know, two contiguous holes that I can now select inside mechanical in order to um, apply my loads and boundary conditions. Okay? So going back to the workbench project window, um, I can now double click on model in order to launch ANSYS mechanical. So my goal here with this simulation is to just verify that I'm not, um, that I'm meeting all of my design criteria from the beginning, right? So what I want to do is I want to make sure that the particular part that I have will now, um, the particular part that I have now meets all of the design goals that I had uh, initially established, which was a less than a 0.05 millimeter um, displacement on that particular cylindrical hole that mounts the bracket at the other side. Okay. So notice now our geometry is a bit more featured, so it does take a, a few more seconds to import the geometry. So once it comes in, so this is the same geometry that was left behind from our cleanup work in space claim. And I'll go ahead and reassign my material properties. In this case, we use structural steel. So I'll apply the same uh, element type there. Uh, I had a coordinate system here before. I'll go ahead and delete that. And for my mesh control, what I'll do is I'll use the same element sizing, but instead I'll now have to reselect this geometry. And for the frictionless support, so these are all of the supports that I had applied in my original structural analysis. So I'll select and rescope those geometries to particular regions. So I'll select all of those individual surfaces. And finally, my force will be applied to this surface here. And I'll go ahead and once all of that work is done, I'll go ahead and solve the model. So when I click solve, what it'll do is it'll actually go through and mesh the geometry. You notice here, it was able to easily create a mesh on that geometry, even though we had all of those complex facets, um, it was still able to create that mesh um, directly on that solid part. And with one go, you know, you go through and you actually solve the model, right? So now I'm looking at that same exact bracket. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm running a design validation step on that part that was actually created by the topology optimizer, right? So now what I'll do is I'll check that same 
deflection on that particular surface. Recall that we were looking at the Y deflection. So what I'll do is I'll insert a directional deformation. I'll choose Y axis on that one face and I'll go ahead and evaluate all results. And if you notice, my deflection went up a bit, about double what it was before, but it's still well below the 0.05 millimeter constraint that I had put on the topology optimizer, right? So even though I started with a, a CAD model that I drew in two seconds in space claim, you know, I was able to get a, you know, much lighter and much less material part, you know, just with a few clicks in, in ANSYS mechanical, okay? Um, and actually on top of that, um, if I was concerned with, you know, is this part 3D printable, I can take that same workflow that I just showed and extend it on to run an additive manufacturing process simulation inside ANSYS Workbench, okay? So with that, um, what I can do is actually model what the deformations and stresses look like on that particular part. So in this animation, I'm just going to show quickly, it'll show a, the actual print process as it's being deposited layer by layer. So if I slow down that animation, you can actually see the stresses and deformations that develop in the part as it's being 3D printed. Um, so just wanted to show that to essentially complete the picture with what's possible in, in the ANSYS workbench environment, okay? So, so with that, I'm actually going to start up a new project, okay? And show just a couple of other examples that, um, you know, ANSYS mechanical can be used for to assess um, structural integrity. Okay. So in this, in this section, I'll, I'll go rather quick just to show some of the capabilities, okay? So I mentioned in, in earlier that, you know, ANSYS Mechanical can be used to simulate multiple physics as well as for data transfer between single physics. So if I'm interested in transferring data from a thermal analysis into a structural analysis, um, I can certainly do that um, using the workbench environment. So what I can do is I can actually link multiple physics together. So in this case, I'll link a steady state thermal to a static structural for thermal stress analysis, and then I'll also do a modal analysis to assess resonance frequencies and mode shapes. And I want to, you know, run all of these different types of analysis, but I only don't want to spend too much time on the pre-processing phase, actually setting up the model. So what I'll do is I'll insert or import a geometry in this case. Um, so in this case, I'm going to also go into my engineering data and same methodology, just request two material inputs. So in this case, I'll design my support structure with aluminum alloy and structural steel. And I'll go ahead and double click on model to start ANSYS Mechanical. So what it's going to do in the background in this case is it's going to start to establish a workflow um, starting from a thermal analysis where I solve for temperatures and then mapping that onto a structural analysis to evaluate things like thermal stress, thermal warpage, thermal deformation. And ultimately, I want to extract the resonance frequencies and mode shapes in, through a modal analysis, okay? So one of the benefits, major benefits of ANSYS Workbench is that once I set up a single simulation, it will propagate all of that setup over into the rest of my analysis. So if you look in this particular case, I'm no longer dealing with a single part. I actually have a multi-part assembly. Um, and with that comes the concept of contact, okay? So anytime I import an assembly that contains more than one part, I will need to define contacts in between each of those parts, okay? So as said before, if you look at the geometry component here, um, there's a question mark next to it, indicating that something is missing, right? So what I'll need to do is select those parts and assign the appropriate material property. So let's say that the brackets are made of structural steel and all of the beams are made of an aluminum alloy, okay? So I'll select all of those entities and choose aluminum alloy for those parts. 
And the next step is to review the contacts, okay? So ANSYS, whenever you import a multi-part assembly, will automatically create contacts for you, okay? So when I rename those based on definition, what it will do is it will tell me the type of contact being used, in this case, bonded. Bonded meaning they are completely attached at the interface between those two parts. Um, and it'll list the two part names that that contact is being used to um, connect. So in this case, I'll actually use body views to hone in on the different contact and target surfaces for this geometry. And I can actually cycle through each contact and review where those contacts are being made. So the next step again is meshing. So the meshing philosophy remains the same. So I'll need to go through and mesh um, either sticking to the defaults or go through each individual part and mesh those geometries. So what I'll do is I'll select those four brackets and I'll insert a particular mesh sizing for those parts. So let's say that these brackets will be 20 millimeters in size for the mesh size. And for everything else, in this case I'll select these, hide them, and select, use the select all option to select all the bodies. And I'll insert another sizing on those. And I'll say that these as well will be 20 millimeters. Okay. Next in this case, what I'll do is I'll insert a meshing method. So there's different uh, methods that you can use to mesh different bodies. So in this case, I'm going to use a multi-zone mesh method for these particular brackets. So I'll choose that for a multi-zone method, which will create a full hexahedral or brick mesh on each of these four brackets. And last thing I'll do is I'll choose my element order to be linear, and I'll go ahead and generate the mesh. So you notice that it will, within a few seconds, it will create a, a nice structured mesh on that geometry. Okay. And the next step here would be to start to establish my boundary conditions. So the first step is going to be a thermal analysis where I, all my loading and boundary conditions will be in terms of temperatures or heats, okay? So what I'll do here is I'll actually specify a pure conduction problem. So I'll actually select the surfaces of these two brackets and I'll right click on steady state thermal, insert temperature. Let's say in this case I have this set to 22 degrees C, <clears throat> and I'll specify another sizing or temperature on these faces to be about 100 degrees C. And the last thing I want to do is I want to define convection heat transfer on all of these different pipes. So in this case, I don't want to select all of these beams that could get you know, tedious. So what I can do is use some of the selection features in mechanical. So in this case, I'll select all surfaces of the same size. And I'll grab those and I'll insert a convection coefficient, and I'll define the heat transfer coefficient to air, which is about five E minus six watts per millimeter squared Celsius. And I'll go through and go ahead and solve the model, right? So when I solve this, what I'm actually looking for is temperatures. So anything that shows up here will be in terms of temperatures and heat fluxes, okay? So I can actually see, um, in the steady state condition, what temperatures develop on those particular geometries. So you notice that uh, heat is conducting and there are certain areas that are staying at 22, which is where I had forced the solver to stay at 22. And there's other areas that are at 100, which is where I define my boundary conditions here. And everything else has some sort of temperature associated with it due to the conduction and convection heat transfer that's going on. Um, so the next step is actually a structural analysis. So I ran the thermal analysis to just to get the temperature profile. And if I go back to my workbench window, I have a link between the solution and the setup of static structural, meaning that I'm passing the temperature solved for in steady state thermal over into the setup of the static structural. So now in the ANSYS mechanical window, you'll see an imported body temperature coming from the thermal analysis. And if I go ahead and generate that, you notice that it maps all of those temperature data um, over into the structural mesh. Now this is very similar to what an 
fluid structure interaction or electromagnetic structural interaction would look like. Generally, how these work is that you transfer certain loading that's determined from a different solver uh, into the mechanical solver to extract things like temperatures, stresses, strains, et cetera, from those um, types of load. Okay. So in this case, I'm importing my body temperature. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to apply my fixed supports to the base of this structure. So what I'll do is I'll highlight the four base points of the structure. I'll right click, insert a, in this case, fixed support. So it cannot move, translate, or rotate about this particular surface, right? So it's essentially fully fixed at that area. Okay. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that all of these pipes that are going across here are pressurized internally, okay? So what I'll do is I'll actually use that same trick. So I'll select one of the inner surfaces of this pipe and I'll use select all entities with the same size. So it'll grab all of those surfaces and I'll use this option to extend to limits. What that does is it will bleed my selection all the way through. So now I have all the internals of those pipes selected, okay? Seems like I missed a couple here. Maybe the size is a bit different. So I can grab those and then use the extend to limits option again to uh, fill out that. So then once I have those surfaces selected, I can right click insert now. This time I'm going to use a pressure, okay? So this window actually shows all of the load types available inside ANSYS Mechanical. So you have your inertial type loading, for example, accelerations, gravity, uh, rotational velocity, et cetera. You have your mechanical force terms, right? Pressures, forces, and different type of special case loads like bulk retention. And then down here in this section, you have your different types of supports, um, which will effectively fix your geometry and your structure, okay? So in this case, what I'm gonna do is specify a pressure, and I'll specify my pressure magnitude to be 10 megapascals on the inner surfaces of these pipes, okay? So again, pressure is a force per unit area, okay? So I'm applying that force per unit area to any of the selected faces that I have on the internals of these pipes. So I'll go ahead and solve the model. Okay, so once I have that done, it will not only this, in this case solve for the imported load, which is my body temperature, so it'll do the thermal expansion, but also for the mechanical pressures that I have applied uh, in, in the internals of those pipes. So now, if I look at my total deformation and my equivalent stress plot, I can review that. So my total deformation is now showing me a significant amount of deformation in the red regions and you know, less deformation or no deformation in the blue regions, right? So looking at this plot, I can actually use the animation scale factor to plot you know, the actual overall trend of how it's displacing, right? So you notice that in reality, this is not displacing this much, right? There's actually a scale factor applied here at the top. So what I can do is use true scale and play that animation, right? And now you can see that it's not deforming quite as much. And now the contours are how you can determine how much displacement you're getting on this part. So in this case, I'm actually getting a, almost a one millimeter displacement at this particular um, region. And I can also review the amount of stress that's being generated. So I noticed that because I have a thermally applied load, I'm actually getting a significant amount of you know, stress in the areas that I'm, you know, restraining the expansion or thermal expansion, right? So I have fixed supports at the base, so naturally I'll have my maximum stresses at the base, right? So one of the benefits of mechanical is that, for example, let's say I don't care anymore about the temperatures. I just want to focus on the pressures. So what I can do is suppress the imported load or the temperatures and just resolve the model. So now in this case, I'm now only evaluating the case that my, the internal, the pipes are being pressurized, but I have no temperature gradient um, mapped to the uh, assembly. So now if I look at my deformation plot, it looks a little bit different, right? So I'm actually getting my maximum deformations in these two pipes that are going across here. And if I look at my equivalent stress plot, I now notice that it's actually the pipes that are receiving the, the highest amount of stress. So I can actually look at 
use the flag to highlight where that maximum stress is occurring. And it's actually occurring on the inside of, of this pipe, but I'm assuming that each of the pipes have a very, very similar stress um, in each of them, right? But the maximum magnitude is about 85.3 megapascals at the region that's highlighted, right? So another thing I might care about is, okay, what if I want to go and pressurize these pipes from zero to 10 megapascals back down to zero, right? So in that case, I'm actually going to do a fatigue type calculation where I assess the life of the part. So what I'll do is I can insert a fatigue tool and there's different types of fatigue that you can model in ANSYS. So in this case, I'm gonna choose a zero base. So that assumes pressurizing from zero to magnitude back down to zero, okay? So that's one cycle. So in this case, what I'll do is I'll insert a life. So I wanna see how many cycles of this pressure that my structure can withstand. So looking at the plot, I see that for this particular pressure, I'm actually getting infinite life on both the bracket and the pipes that are going across. One is labeled at 1E6 cycles. Okay, so these are the number of cycles that you're looking at, cycles to failure. Um, and you can see that 1E8 is the endurance limit for uh, the aluminum, and 1E6 is the limit for um, structural steel, right? But what happens if I increase my pressure magnitude to something like 50 megapascals, right? So I'll increase that magnitude, and now I wanna see if that, um, what type of life I'm going to be seeing if I run it at this max operating pressure and continuously pressurize and depressurize. So once I've done that, you notice that now I have a, a lower minimum life with about 24,000 cycles, okay? So what that means is now I can only cycle um, 23 or 24, almost 24,000 times before I start inducing failure in the part, okay? So these types of things are useful for durability analysis as well as fatigue analysis, okay? So. And the last thing is, okay, so I set up my model for stress analysis and also for thermal analysis, but now I want some understanding of the dynamic properties as well. So what I'll do is I'll run a modal analysis. So to run a modal analysis, this, uh, all of the meshing, contacts, and uh, boundary conditions can be taken from things I've already defined in previous steps. So I can take the fixed support and drag and drop it onto modal. And in the analysis settings here, I can actually choose which, uh, how many resonance frequencies I want to extract. So in my particular example, let's say I'm, I'm very interested in the first 10 resonance frequencies. So what I can do is specify that I want to extract the first 10 modes and go ahead and hit the solve button. And by hitting the solve button, it'll go in and actually start to extract the first 10 resonance frequencies. So once the solution is done, I can now review what the results are. So what it's reporting to me now are the resonance frequencies for this particular assembly. So resonance frequencies are of concern, if you recall from um, the lecture portion of this talk. Um, we, we mentioned that you know, we're interested in regions of resonance because maximum stress occurs at resonance in a body, right? Especially under dynamic loading. So any failures that you're going to get uh, if you excite a resonance frequency in a particular assembly, chances are you will get failures um, or you could potentially get uh, region areas of high stress and instances of high stress in those regions and ultimately cause failure in your part. So you want to avoid in our design, you, we want to avoid resonance frequencies in the operating condition of our assembly or a component. Okay? So, uh, if you notice here, it lists tabularly 10 different resonance frequencies, okay, from 48 to 133 hertz. And what I can do is actually select all and create the mode shape plots for all of those 10 resonance frequencies, okay. So in this case, I can actually review what, at what particular frequency the actual vibrational mode that each of these structures will go through, okay. So in this case, I'm looking at the results at 48 points six hertz, and it's showing me that this is the rocking mode for this particular support assembly. And I can actually go through and review what each of the uh, resonance frequencies are and the mode shapes that are excited at that particular frequency. 
Okay? So a modal analysis is a free vibration analysis. Okay? So it's in the absence of externally applied loads. Okay? So in, in a modal analysis, it's essentially finding your resonance frequencies and mode shapes okay, in the absence of any externally applied load. Now, resonance frequencies in general are proportional to the square root of the stiffness divided by the mass. Okay? So the stiffness and the mass, which are a function of your material properties for elastic modulus and density, okay, um, are really what dictate what your resonance frequencies are. Okay? And you know, with that, with work, the workbench environment, it's very quick to run these types of you know, multi-physics studies, even though we're focused on structural mechanics here, um, all of the workflow with the dragging and dropping of the different blocks, et cetera, are you know, pretty streamlined for either single physics or multi-physics types of problems. Okay? And with one other thing, uh, the final point that I want to make today will, is the use of parameters inside uh, Workbench in order to optimize the design. So for example, uh, in this case, I have a few things that are, are few parameters that are at play here. So in this case, let's say I want to explore the effects of varying this pressure magnitude, right? So if you notice in next to many of the inputs and outputs in mechanical, you'll notice this white box here. And with that white box, you can actually click the parameter flag to uh, turn on the, the parameter um, flag and, and use that inside Workbench to make design of, of experiments or design studies, right? So if you click on the parameter flag here, um, let's say I want to vary that. I also want to vary the temperature magnitude. And I also want to track how that affects, let's say, my re first resonance frequency. Right? So I can select my resonance frequency and set all of those as parameters. Right? I can also set parameters on output variables. Right? So in this case, I'm really interested in my maximum deflection. Let's say I want to um, keep that within a certain range. And I also want to keep my equivalent stress maximum below a certain value. And my fatigue life, let's say my minimum number of cycles, I want to keep track of that as I make different changes to the parameters. Okay. So now, once I've created all of those parameters, if I go back to my workbench window, you'll notice that I now have a parameter set located uh, that are attached, both feeding in and receiving out of each of those analysis systems that are located on the project schematic. So if I click on the parameter set now, you'll notice that I have a tabular input now for my inputs as well as my output variables, right? So blocks or columns B and C actually have um, my input parameters and columns D, E, F, G, and G are my output parameters. So I want to see essentially for different values and different magnitudes of input loads, how that's going to affect my outputs, right? So in this case, I can now tabularly fill in different load cases and see what effects those will have on my output parameters. So I can actually build a design table, you know, filled with different design parameters that I want to explore and actually feed them in here and have it run through a lot of different cases without me having to go back into mechanical and manually type values for loads. And actually populate this list by uh, dumping an Excel file in there or something else um, and really quickly run a series of different design cases directly. Okay? And on top of that, we can actually do optimization studies as well um, using some of the design exploration tools that are located down here. So there's different optimization algorithms that you can take advantage of once you have your parameter sets. And you know, there's different ways that you can actually have goal-driven optimizations. For example, if you want a particular design or candidate point that um, you know, obeys certain criteria, you can certainly set that and have that go and ANSYS will actually optimally pick those points that satisfy those design criteria and uh, give you those candidate points that meet those design criteria. Okay. So with that, uh, that concludes my, my talk for today and I'll turn it back over to Jacob to, to see us off. Thank you very much. Well, 
lot, that was uh, very informative. I hope everyone got a lot out of that. And uh, if, you, if you missed any of it, you know, this is going to turn into a YouTube video, so you can watch it again later. And make sure to tune in on Thursday for our last back to school uh, you know, live stream event. That's uh, Thursday, same time, 5.30 uh, Pacific, same place, our Tech Tips channel. If you're on the Tech Tips channel right now, go ahead and subscribe to us. We come out with tons of great content and I um, hope to see you back soon. So thanks everyone and uh, have a nice evening. All right. Well, uh, you guys have questions? <laughs>